Okay, hello everyone. This is the spring 2022 final exam solution for Calculus 1. Um, we're currently making this video in fall of 2022, so you could use it to study for your exam, but we would like to emphasize it is also very beneficial to look through your homework and all the other resources that you have as this is not sufficient for all of your preparation. Um, but it is good for at least part of it. So I guess let's just jump right in So here we see our first problem it says answer the following multiple choice questions by circling your answer No justification or explanation is required. So consider the function f defined by This piecewise function here. So let's kind of get an idea of what's going on We can see that there's a lot of emphasis on the number two here um, Where's my there we go on the number two so we see what happens if x is less than two x is equal to two x is greater than two so if we were going to kind of imagine something going on at two on the graph we know that at x equals two we are at exactly 10. that's the actual value f of x equals two now when x is less than two it follows x to the fourth minus six so let's see as x approaches two on that what happens so if we say if we say 2 to the fourth minus 6 we get 16 minus 6 and that's 10 so that first function x to the fourth minus 6 as x gets close to 2 it goes it approaches 10 so that means it's actually coming in and joining on that point because because that first function in the piecewise function, x to the fourth minus six, because it is 10 when it gets close to two, and the actual value of two is 10, if we look down here, we can see that this statement, statement two, says as x approaches two from the left, for f of x, that limit, as f of x approaches 2 from the left is equal to f of 2, that statement here would be correct. So we have 2 is right. Now let's make sure we evaluate that other, the other equation in the piecewise function, the one that happens after x is 2. So that one follows the equation 4x to the third. So if I try doing that at 2, we get 4 times 2 to the third, which ends up being 32. So we have something happening up here that looks maybe like that. So we can see that there is a break in our function. And because of that break, we can say that f is not continuous at x equals 2. So statement i, or statement 1, is not correct. We also see that since it is not a smooth curve and there's a break in the function that means that f is not differentiable at that point either so we don't count statement three and then statement four says that the limit as x goes to two of f of x exists now that requires from both sides the limit has to be the same Right, so maybe if we had a curve that was solid and met at the same point, then we could say that the limit exists. But here if we try going from both sides, we get different values. And so that means that it does not exist because from the left and the right, the limits are not the same. So for question 1i, we're going to get only statement 2 as our answer. All right, let's move on to one ii. So oil leaks out of a tank at a rate of r equals f of t gallons per minute. So we really wanna make sure to remember that f of t is a rate, not just an amount of gallons. t is measured in minutes. Which of the following expressions represents the um, exact amount of oil that leaked out of the tank from 15 to 45 minutes after the oil started leaking. Okay, so let's say maybe, I'm just gonna invent a curve here. Maybe it looks like that. 
something along those lines. And let's invent a 15 and a 45. This is just a visual so we can kind of get a better idea of the units. So f of t is measured in gallons per minute. And our time is measured in minutes. The area underneath a rate graph is equal to the total change in the amount that changes with the rate. So here, the shaded area in the bottom that I'm cross-hatching right now, that represents the exact amount of gallons that changed with that rate from 15 minutes to 45 minutes. So we can express that as an integral, right? We can express that as an integral from 15 to 45. And then it's the area underneath f of t dt. So that's one option. We can see that that's actually statement two over here on the left. If we look at statement one, we see that f of 45 minus f of 15. So all that means here, because f of t is a rate in gallons per minute, we're saying the rate at time is 45 minutes minus the rate at time is 15 minutes. So it's just going to give you the difference between the rates, not the change in the amount of oil. So that will not be correct for this thing, for this question. One important thing we want to notice in the question is the word exact. So an integral is considered exact. There's a lot of ways to estimate an integral. Like for example, in statement three here, we see this sum from k is one to 60 of f of 15 plus k over two times one half. So it looks like we are having, essentially it looks like a midpoint sum a midpoint Riemann sum, each rectangle having a width of one half. So there's 60 total rectangles in there. So that is an actually an approximation. That is not an exact answer. And so, oops, did not mean to switch over to eraser. But yeah, so since that is essentially a Riemann sum, and it's just adding up rectangles as an estimation for that area, it is not an exact amount. However, we see something really similar in statement four, where we have the limit as n goes to infinity of a sum from k equals one to n. So that means that we have n number of rectangles, right? And n going to infinity means that we have an infinite number of rectangles. When your number of rectangles in in a Riemann sum goes to infinity, that makes it exact. Because that it when your rectangles are infinitely small, it's the same concept as an integral with an infinitely small dt. So with that, we can say that statement four is also an exact expression for that amount of oil that leaked out of the tank. And given that, we can say that two and four only are our correct answers for one, one part two. So moving on to one part three here, we have a graph of a function, y equals f of x. It does have end behavior indicated by the arrows on either end of the function. And the question asks, on what intervals is f prime of x greater than zero? First thing we want to think about is what does f prime of x mean on a graph? Well, f prime of x is your slope, right? So if we have f prime of x is slope and we want slope greater than zero, that means that we're looking for parts that have a positive slope. That's what we want. So if we look here, we have negative slope, negative slope. Now we have a minimum at negative five, negative six, and that has a slope of zero. After that, we have positive slope, positive slope, another maximum up here, which has a slope of zero once again. Then we're back to negative slopes, a minimum, slope of zero, positive slopes after that. So we can see 
that we have sections here where we have positive slopes. So I'm kind of outlining those right now. And then that just kind of goes off. So from negative five, negative five up to three, we have positive slopes. So negative five, three would be our first interval. This is all negative, so it's not f prime of x greater than zero. And then we start at 10 again, it looks like. So in union, we have 10 with our positive slope. And our end behavior says that it continues off in a positive direction for infinity. So that means that we have 10 to infinity as our second interval. And if we look over at our options, we can see that matches up with option D. Okay, moving on to the next part. Let f of x greater than zero and f prime of x greater than zero for 2 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 4. Okay, so we have f of x is greater than 0, which means we have positive values. And f prime of x is greater than 0 means that we're going to have positive slope. So we can maybe imagine something like this. Right, and maybe we've got 2 there and 4 here. So we're dealing with a positive sloping graph. And here we are looking at these different approximations. We have a right-hand Riemann sum, a left-hand Riemann sum, and a midpoint Riemann sum. And then there is an option that says they're all equal, and there's one that says there's not enough information provided to determine which one's the largest. So if we were going to do a right-hand Riemann sum, we would have our slope, and let's say this is two, this is 3, this is 4, and notice that it says R4, L4, M4 in our options. That means there's four rectangles, so we do actually have uh, rectangles at the half marks. So for a right-hand Riemann sum, for each rectangle, we use the right-hand value as the Y. So here I'm using the right-hand value, and notice that for the area under the graph, the actual area under the graph, I'm gonna switch over to blue here, is just this part, right? That's our actual area under the graph. But we can see with our right-hand Riemann sum that we have an overestimate. So if we did the left-hand one, we draw essentially the same thing again. We've got our two, two and a half, three, three and a half, four. All right, there we go. And we know that our area under the graph is the blue area that we can see on the right-hand one. We're using our left y values this time, so our rectangles are actually underneath the graph, if you can see that. So the area that we're filling in with our left-hand Riemann sum only encompasses the part that I just scribbled in so we have these gaps, right, between the actual amount and the amount that the left hand is estimating. So this is actually an underestimate. So we already can tell just based on this that our right hand is going to be greater than our left hand Riemann sum. Now if we were going to think about the midpoint, the midpoint Riemann sum looks something like so if we have the same kind of line, there's our bottom there, two, three, four, there's our half marks. Very cool. So for each one of the rectangles, you're going to use the middle value. So here it would be like that. And then this one goes up a little bit above the line, goes back under the line to meet that one. So you can see that there's both a bit of overestimate and a bit of underestimate with the midpoint one, and that's why it's kind of, it's called midpoint, but it makes me think of the middle between left and right options, because we have the bits here where it's a little bit over the area, but then it also has the bits like right in here where it's less than the area under the graph. 
So it kind of balances itself out. So we can tell that the right hand estimate is going to be bigger than both of the both the midpoint and the left point Riemann sum. So our largest approximation is going to be our R4 here. Okay. Now moving on to our last problem. We have let f of x equals sine of 2x. Okay, so that would look something like sine of 2x. So because it has that 2 in there with the x, it's been horizontally squished. Normally one full period of the graph would be 2 pi, but here it is only pi. So you have pi, that's at pi over 2. So it's kind of a visualization of f of x. Very cool. So which of the following expressions approximates the value of f of 3? So we want f of 3, right? And here we can notice that 3 is really close to pi, right? Because pi is equal to 3.1415, blah, 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 blah. So we're going to use pi and linearization to estimate f of 3. Now the formula for linearization is, so f of x is approximately L of x, so we're using L of x as our linearization formula, and L of x equals f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a. Okay, so that's our linearization formula, where x is x is what we want to find, the x value of the value that we want to find. So here we have f of 3 is approximately equal to f of a here is our pi. a is the number that we're using to make our linearization and get our value for f of 3. So f of 3 equals f of pi plus f prime of pi, and then we have x is 3, and a is pi again. So we have this equation here now, f of 3 is approximately equal to f of pi, plus f prime of pi times 3 minus pi. Now we need to find what f prime of pi is, right? If we know that f of x equals sine of 2x, Right, then f prime of x equals 2 cosine of 2x. By taking the derivative, we got that. And then if we want f prime of pi, we just plug pi in. So we get 2 cosine of 2 pi. Technically, we can evaluate it, but it looks like in our answer options, all of our trig functions have the numbers just sitting in them. So let's try rewriting this out again. So f of 3 is approximately equal. So f of pi means that we're plugging pi into our f of x function. So that means we have sine of 2 pi plus, then we have f prime of pi. f prime of pi we just found was 2 cosine of 2 pi. And then that is multiplied by 3 minus pi. Okay, so now if we look up at our answer solutions, we can see that E matches up with what we just found. And that concludes part one of our spring 2022 final exam solution. Uh, stay tuned for video with part two.